Swadika, hello and welcome to ASEAN Challenge, the show to give you the latest headlines, hot topics and updates happening around your ASEAN block in two languages, Thai and English. I'm Rosalyn Tepowan. And I'm Alisa Sitiwong. Khao tan rap kun pu chom tuk tan khao su rai kan ASEAN Challenge ka. Khao san rap ASEAN tan phas angkrit la phas Thai. And starting off the show into ASEAN, around us, let's take a look at what's happening around our ASEAN community. First and foremost, starting off in Cambodia, where they kicked off a very important festival that happens once a year. They call it the Festival of the Dead. It happened earlier in October, on October 9th. It's a very big festival where people honor their ancestors. And all over the country, relatives, families flock all over to join and honor their ancestors and various people in their family, the deceased, by visiting a very famous pagoda called the Vehir Sour Pagoda, which is about 46 kilometers outside of Phnom Penh. And at this particular pagoda, so many events took place. It's not just honoring ancestors, but you see here horse races, buffalo races as well. There's a cause for celebration as well as commemoration. That's right. So actually this festival here is a festival that takes place over the course of several days and the ninth was actually the last day of the festival which ends on the 15th day of the 10th month of the Khmer calendar. So this year falls on October 9th, fell on October 9th, of course. And at the pagoda that you mentioned, of course, that's where a lot of people, hundreds of people went to gather and they witnessed horse and buffalo races. As we can see, they're decorated very beautifully. Um, and we can see the crowd just watching the races as well. And after that, they would, of course, um, make merit putting rice into monks' alms bowls and lay various dishes on the floor for the monks to eat as well as they believe that the souls of their deceased loved ones and relatives will be able to come and receive this food as well. So this celebration is considered a very important festival for Cambodians where they believe that this is a time of year when their relatives and family members that have passed away already are able to come back and receive merit, receive food that family members offer. So we can see that various people will go back to their hometowns during this time of the year and a lot of merit making happens to ensure that their relatives that have passed away do receive the merit and food. Right, and it happens on a very special day each year as well. People come from far and wide on the 15th day of the 10th month of the Khmer calendar for hopes of not just uh, giving alms, merit making and celebration, but also gaining luck and prosperity from it as well. So you could see how this event, uh, this important occasion, not only unifies families and people, but unifies the country all together in this belief and faith. And this particular tradition has carried on for quite a long time. The Festival of the Dead has been honoring ancestors since you could say the fall of the Khmer Rouge and uh, the particular regime that killed about a third of the population. So you can imagine how important it is to go and honor their relatives and their deceased, their beloved ones in this history that has occurred in Cambodia where this regime altogether has killed as many as 2.2 million people, executing them, dying them of torturing them, for example, as well, starvation and exhaustion, and the murderous bid to create a peasant utopia that spanned the years of 1975 to 1979. So an important tradition that has been carried on for decades. That's right. So this festival in Cambodian is called Pachum Ben, or is also known as the Ancestors Day as well. And if we compare this to other countries within the ASEAN++ region, you can see that there are quite similar festivals and um, ceremonies that happen with a similar marking or celebration occurring. For example, in Sri Lanka, they also have one that is similar where they offer food to the ghosts of the dead. And in India as well, they also have a similar um, festival or celebration. And the Taiwanese Ghost Festival is also quite similar to the Pachumben here in Cambodia. So we can see that a lot of times festivals and religious ceremonies and cultural um, heritage do 
like spread around the ASEAN plus plus region, and so it's it's a it's something that we share within the ASEAN bloc plus 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 plus, including China as well, That's where they right. also make yearly pilgrimages to honor their ancestors as well. So, so much to overlap and so much to appreciate and uh, so much to continue to unify throughout ASEAN Plus Plus. In the ASEAN around us, we will take you to the United States. In the United States, there is a situation that has been happening in every year. In the past year, it will be the year of the year. It will be the year of the year of the year. The United States will come to the United States. ประเทศกัมพูชานะคะชาวกัมพูชาเนี่ยก็มาที่เราเห็นกันขณะนี้คือวันสุดท้ายของเทศกาลคนตายในวันอังคารที่9ตุลาคมที่ผ่านมาค่ะเพื่อมอบอาหารแล้วก็สวดมนต์แก่วิญญาณของครอบครัวแล้วก็เพื่อนฝูงที่ที่เสียชีวิตไปแล้วนะคะสิ่งที่เราสามารถที่จะเห็นได้ในวันสุดท้ายของเทศกาลนี้คือการแข่งม้าแล้วก็ควายนะคะนอกเหนือจากนี้นะคะผู้คนก็จะไปกันที่เจดีเพื่อถวายพัตาหารแด่พระสงฆ์โดยเชื่อว่าอาหารจะถูกส่งไปที่วิญญาณของผู้ตายนั่นเองนะคะเทศกาลแห่งความตายเนี่ยจะจัดขึ้นเพื่อเป็นเกียรติแก่บรรพบุรุษโดยเริ่มตั้งแต่การล้มสลายของขเขมรแดงซึ่งเป็นระบอบการปกครองที่ฆ่าคนประมาณหนึ่งใน3ของประชากรมีผู้เสียชีวิตถึง 2.2 ล้านคนหรือเสียชีวิตจากการถูกทรมานความอดอยากหรือความอ่อนเพลียในช่วงสงครามซึ่งการฆาตกรรมของขเขมรแดงเนี่ยทำให้เกิดสังคมนิยมของชาวนานในช่วงปีพศ2518ถึง2522นะคะก็เป็นเทศกาลที่เกิดขึ้นทุกปีตั้งแต่อดีตเลยจนถึงปัจจุบันแล้วเราก็สามารถที่จะเห็นเทศกาลคล้ายๆแบบนี้ในหลายๆประเทศในอาเซียนด้วยนะคะใช่ค่ะมีความส่วนคล้ายมากเลยนะคะในเวลาเดียวกันก็เป็นกิจกรรมที่สําคัญสําหรับประเทศกัมพูชาด้วยเป็นพิเศษเลยค่ะ But that was our highlight for ASEAN around us With that said we take a short break now coming back ASEAN hot issues stay tuned Welcome back to the program into ASEAN Hot Issues Now. We take a look at what's happening around the ASEAN bloc, making headlines in the news and other developments, starting off with what's going on in Indonesia, where the situation continues to unravel with the country reeling from a recent earthquake of a 7.5 magnitude, also a tsunami that had struck off Sulawesi Island last week as well, leaving rumbling effects all over the area, especially in the city of Palau where various uh, teams of rescue operations have been carrying on trying to locate the missing people. According to reports, there are more than 5,000 people still likely to be missing in Palu. But the problem is a lot of government efforts have actually been slowing over the past few days now. Residents had come out to insist that the government continue with rescue efforts. But at the same time, the government has been pondering whether or not they should actually just take a step back or even stop rescue efforts because of the difficulties in the area at the moment. That's right. Speaking of the difficulty in the area, of course, in one of the villages, which is an area particularly hard hit by liquefaction, of course, which turns the ground into roiling Quagmere, destroying houses and dragging people under the mud and debris has made it very difficult for authorities to go into the area itself. And that's part of the reason why the government has made a decision or wants to make a decision to stop the rescue operations but of course family members of people who are missing are expressing their concerns and they want the government to continue with the rescue operations at least in order to bring out the body so that they can pay tribute and and perform religious ceremonies for funeral rites and other um, cultural religious rites as well in order to pay respect to their if it if they are deceased of course and they do believe that there's still a lot of people missing um, that could be, of course, found if the government continues with the rescue efforts. That's right. You saw earlier one of the villagers said that 10 brothers are still missing in the rubble of one area called Balaroa and said it's not for the government to decide whether or not they should stop looking for the missing. 
thousands still missing after the quake and tsunami. So we can relate and actually give our condolences as well to those with missing or deceased relatives still reeling from it and still not just trying to get their lives back but trying to survive the difficulties at the moment. But still, according to the latest death tolls, it seems the disaster death toll had brought uh, had accumulated to more than 1,940 still considered dead and um, you could see that perhaps more are on the rise. But the government at the same time had given up on preserving and uh, trying to dig for locating the dead. Actually, they created a big underground uh, ceremonial tunnel, you could say, to, to actually just place the bodies and bury them right there because there are so many dead. แล้วค่ะมาดูกันในส่วนของอาเซียนฮอตอิชชูในสัปดาห์นี้นะคะมาเริ่มกันที่ประเทศอินโดนีเซียกับความเคลื่อนไหวนะคะเกี่ยวกับแผ่นดินไหวที่เกิดขึ้นนะคะก่อนหน้านี้ซึ่งภายหลังจากที่สำนักงานบริหารจัดการภัยพิบัติแห่งชาติของอินโดนีเซียนะคะหรือว่า BNPB ประกาศเตรียมยุติภารกิจค้นหาผู้สูญหายจากเหตุธรณีพิบัติภัยบนเกาะสุลาวาสีนะคะอย่างเป็นทางการในวันที่10ตุลาคมที่ผ่านมาโดยที่ให้เหตุผลว่ามีข้อจำกัดในการเข้าถึงพื้นที่ที่ประสบภัยบางแห่งซึ่งเป็นพื้นดินชุ่มน้ำเป็นทุนเดิมอยู่แล้วหรือว่าเป็นดินเหนียวตะกอนจึงอ่อนตัวได้ง่ายจากการที่เกิดแผ่นดินไหวนะคะก็เป็นปรากฏการณ์ที่เรียกว่าแผ่นดินเหลวหรือว่า soil liquefaction นะคะการใช้งานอุปกรณ์ขนาดใหญ่จึงเป็นเรื่องลำบากแล้วก็สุ่มเสี่ยงต่อสวัสดิภาพของทีมปฏิบัติงานเองด้วยนั้นบรรดาครอบครัวแล้วก็ญาติพี่น้องนะคะที่ของผู้เสียหายก็ต่างรวมตัวกันแสดงความเสียใจแล้วก็ไม่พอใจต่อเจ้าหน้าที่โดยส่วนใหญ่ยืนยันว่าต้องการรับศพกลับไปเพื่อประกอบพิธีตามประเพณีแล้วก็ตามหลักศาสนาเพื่อพร้อมทั้งนี้ก็วิจารณ์รัฐบาลว่าถอดใจในการช่วยเหลือประชาชนและกล่าวด้วยว่าหน่วยกู้ภัยยังไม่เคยเข้าไปในไปสำรวจพื้นที่บางแห่งอีกด้วยซ้ำนะคะก็เกิดความไม่พอใจกับในส่วนของญาติพี่น้องนะคะที่รัฐบาลมีความคิดว่าอยากจะยกเลิกการค้นหาคนต่อไปใช่ค่ะแต่ว่าอย่างไรก็ตามนะคะทางเจ้าหน้าที่ต่างๆก็กล่าวว่าภารกิจการค้นหาคนอาจดำเนินการต่อไปนะคะแต่ว่าดำเนินการยังจำกัดค่ะในบางพื้นที่ซึ่งอาจจะอันตรายสำหรับเจ้าหน้าที่เราก็จะคอยติดตามนะคะว่าจะมีการค้นหาต่อไปมากน้อยขนาดไหนแล้วก็คอยรายงานอัปเดตค่ะ But in the meantime, we'll keep you posted on those developments as the rescue efforts continue for the missing and the dead. But meanwhile, we turn from Indonesia now. We head over to the Philippines for developments in one of the most, you could say, controversial situations that are still ongoing, considering the extrajudicial killings may still be ongoing in the Philippines by Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte. In a recent admittance, he gave a speech recently about uh, an oath-taking ceremony. In fact, it's a routine speech that he gives for bureaucrats. It happened late September, but he addressed the issue of sins. And in his own words, he came out to say, what is my sin? Did I steal even one peso? Did I prosecute someone whom I jailed? He merely said, my only sin is the extrajudicial killing, but he did not elaborate further on the those notes and so it seems judging from his comment here he appeared to admit responsibility for the judicial extrajudicial killings that happened in the we could say justified reason for his crackdown on drugs and various illicit narcotics but at the same time in response to that his spokesman had since said those words were actually playful and misinterpreted so you could say the Interpretation and interpreting continues. That's right. So Duterte, of course, has been known for rambling and at times perplexing speeches. Apparently conceded that summary executions had taken place during his war on drugs, something he has vigorously denied when accused by rights groups and critics. Now the situation uh, in the background or surrounding this situation, how this occurred, of course, is because police have killed more than 4,800 people since Duterte took office in July of 2016 and unleashed his anti-drug crackdown. Now, the government denies activist allegations that police are exterminating drug users and say those killed were all dealers who had resisted arrest. That's right. In the meantime, he still faces much pressure from the international community because of this death toll and this rising, uh, you could say, 
accusations. So he himself has been accused of by the International Crime Criminal Court, or ICC, of crimes against humanity and much more. So we'll keep be, you, be keeping you posted on those developments. ผิดชอบในการสังหารบุคคลภายนอกในสัปดาห์ที่ผ่านมาโดยประธานาธิบดีของฟิลิปปินส์โรดริโกดูเตเต้ดูเหมือนจะยอมรับผิดชอบในการ
trade with leaders from Mekong countries earlier on October 8th. In Tokyo, ahead of the Mekong-Japan summit meeting, to discuss various important matters and also, of course, extend friendship between countries. Now, this news conference as well happened after the bilateral meeting to discuss what had been agreed upon during the meeting. But various leaders that attended the meeting ahead of time was Cambodia's Prime Minister Hun Sen, who welcomed this invitation to join the meeting and invite young politicians to Japan as well. But also at the same time, other important figures from ASEAN joined, such as Myanmar's de facto leader Aung San Suu Kyi, also being among those who attended. That's right. So the Mekong Summit meeting, of course, takes place annually since 2009 and has been able to strengthen the relationship between Japan and the Mekong countries, including CLMVT, which is Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Thailand, and Vietnam. นะคะอันนี้ก็เป็นข่าวคราวเรื่องการประชุมนะคะที่เกิดขึ้นที่ประเทศญี่ปุ่นนะคะซึ่งทางนายกรัฐมนตรีของญี่ปุ่นชินโ
back to the program. Up next is ASEAN Calendar to mark your dates with. ค่ะในช่วงนี้ ASEAN Calendar นะคะก็จะมีกิจกรรมอีเวนต์ต่างๆให้คุณผู้ชมได้รับชมกันค่ะคุณลินจัวโอ้ยคุณเจ้าคุณลิน The 8th to the 17th of October 2017 Vegetarian Festival in Thailand. This festival is known as t e s a g a n g i n j e t e s a g a n means festival, while g i n j e means to eat Chinese vegetarian food. When is the festival? The vegetarian festival is an annual event held in the ninth lunar month, according to the Chinese calendar. It starts on the first day of the waxing moon and lasts for nine days. The festival usually falls in the month of October. Vegetarian festival origins. The vegetarian festival was brought to Phuket and Trang in the south of Thailand by Chinese boatmen in the 19th century. These Chinese had strong beliefs in Taoism. Taoism worships nine gods. These gods are believed to take the form of planets and have direct influence on the five elements: earth, water, wind, fire, and gold. That makes up the physical body. In the beginning, only the Chinese Thai partook in the vegetarian festivals, but over time, it's grown into a nationwide practice. There are many devoted Chinese Thai who eat J food all year round. These Buddhists practice at the temple regularly. Purpose of eating Chinese vegetarian food: to cut down on the number of animal lives that otherwise would be killed for food; to plant the seeds of kindness in one's heart in order to cleanse the mind; to give good health and longevity. Main food sources of Chinese vegetarian food include soy sauce and mushroom sauce for vegetarians in Thailand. Chinese vegetarians get their proteins and nutrients from soybeans, tofu, soy products, imitation meats. Other beans and vegetables. The main source of calcium is roasted black sesame seeds. Fish sauce is a popular seasoning in Thai dishes, in which is replaced with soy sauce and mushroom sauce. During the Chinese vegetarian festival, all the restaurants and food stalls that sell J food put up yellow flags. Vegetarian restaurants in Thailand put up yellow flags. These flags feature the word J in Thai or Chinese. Most people associate J food with not eating any meat, but the true meaning of J is observing the eight precepts. One of which is not eating after midday. When the Chinese character in the word J is studied in detail, we learn that every brushstroke carries a deeper meaning and outlines how we should live our lives. Not only do true J practitioners eat Chinese vegetarian food, they also give attention to what they say, do, and think. One could say that J is a combination of vegetarianism and mindfulness practice. The 15th of October 2018, Memorial Day for late King Norodom Sihanouk. The official day of homage to late King Father Norodom Sihanouk falls on the 15th of October. The day is set by the Cambodian government as a memorial day for former King Norodom Sihanouk. The day is also included in a sub decree on public holiday calendars for 2014. The circular issued by the government requires all ministries, institutions, public and private enterprises to organize the Memorial Day in accordance with the Cambodian customs and tradition. It is also instructed that all Cambodian embassies and consulates, general to foreign countries, to hold the day in accordance with national prestige and pride on international arena. The most revered ex-king Norodom Sihanouk of Cambodia died of illness at the age of 90 in Beijing on October 15, and his body was transported to Phnom Penh by Air China jumbo jet on October 17. The country announced a week of mourning from October 17 to the 23rd, and the body of the king father will be lying in the state at least three months at the royal palace before the body is cremated. Born on October 31, 1922, King Sihanouk reigned the country from 1941 to 1955, and again from 1993 until his voluntary abdication on October 7, 2004, in favor of his son, the current King Norodom Sihamouni. Sihanouk was the king who led the country to gain independence from France in 1953. He had been a presence through decades of political and social turmoil in Cambodia, despite long periods of exile overseas. 
He was named the father of independence, territorial integrity, and national reconciliation and unity. He suffered from various forms of cancer, diabetes, and hypertension, and had been treated by Chinese doctors in Beijing for years before his death. The 23rd of October, 2018, Full Moon Day of Tading Yut. Full Moon Day of Tading Yut is one of the most important of public holidays in Myanmar. It is a Buddhist holiday that celebrates the coming of Buddha back from heaven after he stayed there during Buddhist Lent, teaching his mother and other heavenly gods his various laws and doctrines. The holiday comes on the full moon of the Buddhist lunar month of Tading Yut, just after the completion of Lent. On the Gregorian calendar, it often falls sometime in October. Full Moon Day in Tading Yut is also known as Myanmar's Festival of Lights. It is thought that Buddha and other heavenly beings built a star ladder on Buddha's way down to earth and that people put lights all over their homes to welcome him. Today, the tradition of lighting up buildings continues. Across the country, people also use clay lamps fueled by sesame seed oil and cotton wick. On Full Moon Day of Tading Yut, there are fundraising drives for charities, musical performances, street dancing, and all manner of festivities and entertainment. It is also a day on which children pay respect to their elders, on which many couples get married after the long Lenten period, which traditionally is not supposed to have any weddings. The 23rd of October 2018, Chula Longkorn Memorial Day. Chula Longkorn Memorial Day is an important holiday that gives Thai citizens an opportunity to pay respect to King Chula Longkorn. King Chula Longkorn revitalized Thailand for the 20th century. He was loved due to his progressive policies and diplomatic measures. Chula Longkorn Memorial Day celebrates his life and accomplishments. Chula Longkorn was born into the house of Chakri as the son of King Rama IV. As a child, Chula Longkorn held a position in the royal court of Siam. Along with his political experience, Thailand's most beloved leader learned much through formal schooling. As a student, he studied biology, swordsmanship, engineering, English, and anthropology. According to his teachers, Chula Longkorn was a man of many talents. When he became king, he toured colonized areas like Singapore. After studying European politics and military science, he westernized the Thai government and military. Many scholars believe that Chula Longkorn's actions allowed Thailand to maintain much sovereignty during the peak of global colonization efforts by European powers. Important Acts Economic Reform During King Chula Longkorn's 42-year rule of Thailand, he implemented many policies that bolstered the Thai economy. These measures helped Thai people from across all social classes. By using a Western economic model, Chula Longkorn was able to increase the per capita income of many Thai citizens. These pure economic efforts were aided by policies that removed institutions and extracted resources and income from the people of Thailand. Abolition of Slavery and the Corvée System for moral and economic reasons, King Chula Longkorn introduced many laws that made the extractive institutions of slavery and the corvée system illegal in Thailand. In Thailand, the corvée system was a forced labor model that forced certain groups in Thailand to work for the Thai government with limited compensation. Chula Longkorn viewed the system to be immoral as slavery. To ensure that Thai citizens would be able to enjoy the freedom of choice and the fruits of their labor, he eradicated all forms of forced labor in Thailand. Implementation of Western Values Since Chula Longkorn was well versed in the teachings of Western philosophers like Hobbes and Locke, he sought to expand positive European values to his people. During his reign, people enjoyed many rights, including freedom of speech and the right to assembly. And those were our events on ASEAN Calendar. It's time for another short break, but when we come back, ASEAN Interview is ahead, so don't go away.
Welcome back into ASEAN Challenge. Now we head over to ASEAN Interview to follow up on what's happening with the Rohingya situation both in Bangladesh and beyond. ใช่แล้วในช่วงนี้ ASEAN Interview นะคะจะพาคุณผู้ชมไปติดตามสถานการณ์ของโรฮิงญาค่ะซึ่งสร้างความกังวลต่อหลายๆประเทศรวมไปถึง EU ด้วยนะคะว่าสถานการณ์จะเป็นอย่างไรกันบ้างติดตามมันได้ค่ะ The European Union is sending a fact-finding mission to assess whether to withdraw preferential trade treatment from Myanmar over human rights abuses. This is according to the EU's trade chief, Cecilia Melstrom, on Friday, October 5th. So we have notified the Myanmar authorities that a uh, fact-finding mission emergently will be arriving in the country the coming days to assess the situation on the ground. And this high-level mission is... Uh, uh, in the framework of a potential withdrawal of uh, the everything but arms. Uh, we cannot exclude this outcome. And, of course, the reason is, as you said, the, the blatant violations of human rights in, in Myanmar. On Cambodia, we are even one step further because we had a high-level mission there uh, this summer. And uh, here also there was the elections uh, marked by harassment and intimidation and everything but fair elections, severe restrictions on essential political rights. So I have uh, notified Cambodia today that we will launch the procedure for withdrawal of, uh, of EBA. Uh, without clear and demonstrable improvements, this will lead to a suspension of the trade preferences. Some European companies have already cut business with Myanmar with Cartier stopping purchasing gemstones from the country on December 8, 2017, citing abuses against the Rohingyas. A high-level mission in Cambodia led European Union to the view that political structure of Cambodia can no longer be considered a democracy. So the everything but arms trade status is now being revoked. Malmström added that the EU was planning to remove the EBA status for Cambodia. The bloc had said in July that the country risked losing its preferential trade status after elections decried by the West as neither free nor fair returned the country's strongmen to power after 30 years in office. Human rights group Amnesty International said on Friday the European Union should focus its pressure on Myanmar's military leadership as the bloc said it was considering trade sanctions for Myanmar in a toughening of EU policy on human rights in Southeast Asia. We support an approach where sanctions and, uh, are applied against the military leadership. For example, they have money outside of the country, sitting in places in Singapore, banks and so on. We would rather see a targeted use of sanctions where the perpetrators of the violence are supported. Secondly, we'd also like to see the Security Council of the UN using its influence to ensure that uh, there's a proper prosecution at the ICC, the International Criminal Court. and. Uh, and then we have to be careful here that we don't double punish uh, the people because the military and the political leadership will still live in comfort and could actually leave people. So at this stage we'd say more targeted against the military leadership. We know who they are, we name them, the UN report has confirmed who they are. There's no reason why we can't go after them. And secondly, we'd like to see a serious support of the ICC in terms of ensuring that the generals are held accountable. What Aung San Suu Kyi has done in a role as the leader of parliament has been a betrayal of press freedom, uh, minorities in Myanmar, democracy, and I think that they should use their offices as best as they can to try to bring her back to the person that she was because she's unrecognizable to the elders that she was part of, uh, all the progressive things that she did in the past. And, um, and we would hope that she uh, stands up to the, to the military uh, and, and, and puts a gap. Right now there is very limited distance between her and the military uh, leadership. 
The UN Refugee Agency voiced deep concern on Friday, October 5th, for the safety and security of seven Rohingya men deported from India to Myanmar, saying they'd been denied access to legal counsel and had a chance to have their asylum claims assessed. India deported the Rohingya Muslim men on Thursday, October 4th, raising fears of further repatriations among those sheltering in refugee camps in the country and concern that those returned faced the risk of abuse at the hands of Myanmar authorities. Today, the UN Refugee Agency is greatly concerned for the safety and security of seven Myanmar nationals who were returned from India to Myanmar on Thursday. We understand that prior to their return, the group of seven were moved from Silchar Central Jail in Assam, where they had been in detention since 2012, to Manipur State, bordering Myanmar. UNHCR continues to seek clarifications from the authorities on the circumstances under which these individuals were returned to Myanmar. The UN Refugee Agency is concerned that they did not have access to a legal counsel, were not given a chance to access asylum processing, and have their claims assessed in India. What is worrying, the context of this return comes as hundreds of thousands of Rohingya people have fled from Myanmar over recent de decades. In the latest, latest refugee crisis, more than 720,000 Rohingya refugees found shelter in Bangladesh since, tw since 25th of August last year. Current conditions in Myanmar, Rakhine State, are not conducive for safe, dignified, and sustainable return of stateless Rohingya refugees. And that was ASEAN Interview and wraps up our program for this week. We'll see you next week. As for now, so at the cast.